Ambassador Mohammad Lasseth, Honorable Ministers, Honorable Members of Parliament, Honorable Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Members of the Media, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. I thank the Tunisian Institute of Strategic Studies for inviting me here today. Tunis is a city where some 700 years earlier, Ibn Khaldun was born. He wrote about the persistent human propensity to disregard changed conditions. In the process, he told us a good deal about the rise and fall of political and military power. His formulation on the philosophy of history, according to the historian Arnold Toynbee, was, and I quote, undoubtedly the greatest work of its kind that has ever yet been created by any mind in any time or place, end of quote. My subject today is India and the world. Before delving into it, I wish to draw attention to a very disorderly world that all of us today. An eminent American strategic thinker and practitioner of the art of realpolitik described the 20th century as a period of mega death and meta myth, spawned false notions of total control derived from an arrogant assertion of total righteousness. More recently, he wrote, and I quote him again, the world is now interactive and interdependent. It is also, for the first time, a world in which the problems of human survival have begun to overshadow more traditional international conflicts in the world. Commenting in the same strain, but from a different perspective, a historian has observed that our world risks both explosion and implosion. It must change since the price of failure is down. You will recall that in the wake of the end of the Cold War and the expectation of an era of global cooperation for common good, a comprehensive agenda for peace was enunciated, focused on preventive diplomacy, peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building. Other initiatives came forth for addressing human security questions pertaining to economic development, social justice, environmental protection, democratization, disarmament, respect for human rights, and the rule of law. Together, they helped delineate a new paradigm of security aptly articulated, articulated in 1999 by the then UN Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, and I quote, we must broaden our view of what is meant by peace and security. Peace means much more than the absence of war. Human security can no longer be understood in purely military terms. Rather, it must encompass economic development, social justice, environmental protection, democratization, disarmament, and respect for human rights and the rule of law, end of quote. Although interstate conflicts have admittedly declined, the experience of the past quarter of a century shows the manner in which the expectations of a more comprehensive collective have been belied. And I give you a few instances. One, there has been a phenomenal increase in low intensity civil conflicts. Two, there has been an increase in violence against unprotected civilians. Three, some of these conflicts have spilled across state boundaries and their principal victims are civilians. Four, 
they have dislocated human populations and are endangering human security. And fifth, they tend to undermine the national state and are creating friction between neighboring countries. We have witnessed the ease with which regional and sub-national conflicts have spiraled into broader conflict and become a global security challenge. These threats are increasingly emanating from non-state non-state sources such as organized crime, organized terrorist outputs, and fighters. Even more disturbing is the trend where non-state armed groups appear as parties in violent conflict. The traditional security architecture has been slow to respond to these new realities, even as the economic prominence of new players is remarkably well understood. While emerging economies have secured a role in the global economic system, the Security Council of the United Nations remains a captive of its five permanent members. This intransigence has constrained the ability of the established security system to address the evolving nature of security challenges. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the broad landscape in which India has endeavored in recent decades to address its developmental challenges and its role in the world. Some of its salient features are, firstly, 25 years after economic liberalization that began in the year 1991, 25 years have transformed India's economy. The average annual growth rate of 7% has increased wealth, allowing millions of Indians to take part and to benefit from a globalized world. Despite this, about one third of our population lives in extreme poverty, and we face formidable challenges of education training, human, and infrastructure development. <coughs> Secondly, our total global trade grew from 37.3 billion US dollars in 1991 to 758.5 billion dollars in 2016. In other words, a 24-fold <coughs> growth in the last 25 years. There has been a phenomenal increase in India's industrial and agricultural outputs. A business-friendly India is today one of the leading recipients of foreign direct investment in a range of sectors. Thirdly, the availability of additional resources has allowed us to invest more in education and welfare of ourselves, which in turn has provided India with a wealth of scientific and entrepreneurial talent. Fourth, India is recognized as the world leader in pharmaceutical sector and the information technology domain. Our capacity in space technology, our, I mean you pardon, our capability in space technology and nuclear sciences has been recognized globally. Fifthly, strong growth has added to India's maritime and strategic capacity. Our defense capabilities have increased. So has our capacity to provide overseas security and humanitarian support to our friends and those in need. We like to resolve our conflicts peacefully in the negotiating, but at the same time would like to have an effective and credible deterrence capacity to protect our legitimate interests. India, friends, is not a rejectionist power. 
that stands outside the global order. Instead, her interests lie in working to change, reform, and improve the global order. This demands increased external engagement within the ambit of a non-intrusive policy. A peaceful periphery is critical to our success. And we believe that the entire South Asian region needs to grow with India for our sustainable prosperity. Neighborhood First has therefore been a key component of India's worldview with a strong sense of priority being attached to enhancing cooperation with immediate neighbors. The South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, or SAR, has been infused with new energy even as we have continued our bilateral cooperation with the United We have adopted an Act East policy based on enhanced connectivity with maritime neighbors to the East. The deepening of strategic and commercial ties with the Indian Ocean Rim countries has been a priority. Our Link West approach has invigorated cooperation with West Asia and the Persian Gulf. We consider the Middle East peace process as the key to resolve long pending issues and prevent further radicalization of the region. We have sought enhanced connectivity with Eurasia through initiatives such as the Chabahar port and related infrastructure and the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India TAPI pipeline, a project whose initiation I personally attended last year with leaders from partners. Our relationship with the major powers have expanded exponentially in the last two decades. We share a strategic relation with the United States and our cooperation has deepened across a range of activities on the foundations of a convergence of our economic and political views. With Russia, we have had traditionally good relations which have expanded significantly in energy and defense cooperation sectors. With China, the bilateral trade has expanded considerably with new avenues of economic cooperation being created. With Japan, a range of cooperation activities are being implemented, especially in the infrastructure sector. We have reached out to our friends in Africa through initiatives such as the India-Africa Forum Summit held last year in New Delhi. We convened a conclave of South Pacific Islands to explore issues of mutual interest and define India's contribution in their growth and development goals. With other emerging economies, we have collaborated such as under the BRICS Forum to develop more equitable global governance systems. The agenda for global issues and of multilateral diplomacy remains a matter of perennial interest to us. India has been a major contributor to international peacekeeping operations under the United Nations flag and has engaged with our partners in shaping the Sustainable Development Goals agenda and continues to work with like-minded countries to make the global financial and trade system more equitable and transparent and to address our common challenges such as environmental degradation. India took the lead at the recently concluded COP21 at Paris to forge an international consensus and has become 
one of the strongest advocates of clean energy, particularly solar energy and energy innovation. We do believe that as one-sixth of the humanity and in keeping with the growing cap capacities and aspirations of our people, India has a much larger role to play in charting a more equitable and sustainable future for our world. For this reason, we believe that any global forum which does not include India has limited benefits. Ladies and gentlemen, West Asia and North Africa is not an unfamiliar region to India. Historical ties, cultural bonds, shared interests and concerns characterize our relations. We have a vital stake in the stability, security and economic well-being of this region and are willing to expand our strategic and economic partnership. There are several areas where our interests converge. Our bilateral trade with the region in the year 2014-15 was about $49.58 billion and is expected to grow further despite the economic downturn. We also look to this re region for ensuring our energy security and for commodities like phosphates. This region with its young population and natural resources has tremendous growth potential. It can act as a bridge between three continents of Asia, Africa and Europe. Indian companies have started to increase their investments in the region. There is a considerable potential for expanding trade in areas of automotive components, automobiles, engineering products, information technology, pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and healthcare sectors. There are also areas of common concern. Terrorism has emerged as a principal global challenge. Your country, like my own, has suffered the horrors of the scourge of humanity. Terrorism today has global reach. No city remains safe. There is a new level of threat to pluralist and open societies. Our structures, the old structures of terrorism also remain. There are countries that still use it as an instrument of state policy. There can be no distinction between good and bad terrorists. A terrorist is a terrorist. One who commits crime against humanity cannot have any religion or be afforded any political sanction. International terrorism can only be defeated by organized international action. We need to restructure the international legal framework, such as by adopting a comprehensive convention on international terrorism to deal with the challenges of terrorism. Societies that stand for peace and share values of humanism have to increase their cooperation in intelligence sharing. We should strengthen our efforts to prevent the supply of arms to terrorists disrupt terrorist movements, and curb and criminalize terror financing. We have to help each other secure our cyber space and minimize use of internet and social media for terrorist activities. Relations between India and Tunisia have been friendly and free of discord, and there are many distinguished personalities present here who would vouch for it. We share common principles and have a similar approach on many issues. India has extended strong support 
to the Tunisian struggle for independence and today India stands ready again to provide all possible support as you embark on a path of freedom and democracy. Tunisia can also be a hub of our trade with both Europe and Africa. Tunisia can leverage our expertise and proven capabilities in the production of pharmaceuticals, especially generic medicines at affordable costs, advancement in healthcare sectors, science and technology, and provision of high quality education at reasonable cost. Its advantage. I see a prosperous and peaceful future as our commercial and political interaction deepens. It will open a new era of peace and prosperity, not only for our country, not only for our two countries, but for the entire region. I thank you for being such patient listeners. I will try to answer. Thank you.